and I'm happy that every single person is here online and in person and anyone who may see this Advent week for a sermon and whole service later. So this today, we are going to finalize Advent. So we like come to this crescendo of Jesus, his arrival, and now we kind of Christmas Eve going to Christmas morning. I hope you take time to unwrap the gift of Jesus and really think about why we're doing this beautiful thing of Christmas. And what I've been telling Natalie, our daughter, you know, who's only two and a half, I've been telling her, uh, Jesus, it's his birthday, but he shares his gifts with us. So it's, even though it's his birthday, he lets all of us give gifts to each other, you know, and he, you know, so she's learning about that. Um, but he really does do that. And so today our, our, the general theme for most churches in this week of Advent is love and adoration. I think we saw that through the songs, just this love and adoration. But the specific theme for us today is not only Jesus, the door, our gift, but specifically the door of salvation. That's what we're talking about. And how much love do we want to pour on him, thinking about um, everything that uh, Pastor Sui read in John 3. But this is what I want to just move through this. I want us to be continuing to think of this metaphor of the door, right? So the doorway, it speaks of a beginning, of the opening to something. And even as we have moved through our Advent theme, we've understood Jesus not as only the door, but this idea of Jesus coming to our door, like our painting that we've had um, with William Hunt. And doors, they are made for entries and exits. And there are times when we desperately need to enter somewhere or something, right? Or, conversely, we desperately need to exit somewhere or something, right? And doors that we walk through can be the pivotal moment of our destinies coming to fruition. So we always talk about a door of opportunity. Well, that can be your pivotal destiny moment when you walk through a door metaphorically. Doors are for revelation. In Revelation 4, we're going to read something about that later. Doors are for revelation. But today we're encountering Jesus as this door of salvation. Now I want to tell you what salvation is. You know what it is probably, but I want to read what the Oxford Dictionary says. It says that salvation is preservation or deliverance from harm, ruin, or loss. And that's the almost the best way we can even describe what Jesus did, right? He delivered and preserved us from harm, ruin, and loss. All of those things. And then, of course, similar words to salvation are lifeline, preservation, conservation, means of escape. That's that door of exit we need from the Lord. Theologically, we know it's deliverance from sin and consequences of the sin. And, of course, believed by us to be through faith in Jesus, right? Not through faith in ourselves, not through faith in any other system, but through Jesus himself, the person of Jesus. But... Today, we're going to read in the Bible, it's going to be an unusual unusual passage to read for Advent, but you're going to see how it ties in. We're going to be in 2 Kings chapter 4, verses 18, I'm sorry, 8 through 19. So if you have your Bible, 2 Kings chapter 4, starting in verse 8, and it will also be on the screen. Uh, but this is what it says. It says, one day... Um, and let me say this real quick. This is just a very unique account of a prophet and a woman and her son, just to kind of get that out there first. But one day, Elisha went to the town of Shunem. A wealthy woman lived there, and she urged him to come to her home for a meal. After that, whenever he passed that way, he would stop there for something to eat. She said to her husband, I am sure this man who stops in from time to time is a holy man of God. Let's build a small room for him on the roof and furnish it with a bed, a table, a chair, and a lamp. Then he'll have a place to stay whenever he comes by. One day Elisha returned to Shunem, and he went up to this upper room to rest. He said to his servant Gehazi, Tell the woman from Shunem I want to speak to her. When she appeared, Elisha said to Gehazi, Tell her we appreciate the kind concern you have shown us. What can we do for you? 
Can we put you in, put in a good word for you to the king or to the commander of the army? No, she replied. My family takes good care of me. Later, Elisha asked Gehazi, what can we do for her? Gehazi replied, she doesn't have a son and her husband is an old man. Call her back again, Elisha told him. When the woman returned, Elisha said to her as she stood in the doorway, next year at this time, you'll be holding a son in your arms. No, my lord, she cried. Oh, man of God, don't deceive me and get my hopes up like that. But sure enough, the woman soon became pregnant, and at that time, the following year, she had a son, just as Elisha had said. One day, when her child was older, he went out to help his father, who was working with the harvesters. Suddenly, he cried out, My head hurts. My head hurts. His father said to one of the servants, Carry him home to his mother. And we're going to pause there for a second. So we see Elisha and this uh, Shunammite son, and we see this mother who all she wanted to do was provide a place for the prophet to stay, right? She didn't really ask for anything else. She just understood who was in her presence. She understood that a man of God was there. And when he kept passing by, she decided to bless him. And, you know, she actually made room for him. That's another Advent message in this story for us. She prepared a room for Elisha to stay in. And we don't only prepare him room like the Christmas carol says, but we prepare our lives to completely house Jesus. We welcome him in to live in every part of our lives. But even here with this Shunammite woman or this woman from Shunam, she has prepared a place for this man of God. And so she understands the times and seasons she is in. She understands that she's not getting this visit for nothing. She understands this is a, the knock at the door when he came by was a door of opportunity. It was something that was her destiny before she even knew it. She did it in faith. But here she is. She's not had a son. Why is it Interesting to note that Gehazi, his servant, says, well, she doesn't have a son and her husband is very old. Well, because you depended on men to take care of you. Okay, you got to remember what, you know, world we're living in here. You did not have as a woman just, you couldn't just be like, you know, I'm going to go out and just get a job and make it work. That's not how the ancient biblical world worked. You depended on a father you depended on a husband but if your husband was very old who did you depend on a son yeah or your children but a son specifically and so you know Elisha looks into what she needs and he, see, he sees that she needs something to protect her save her for the future even and so he says th you know the Lord through him really you'll have a son this time next year but here we have at this end of the part we just read He's crying out, my head hurts. Something struck this little boy. And the father says, okay, take him home to his mother. So we see Elisha, we see the Shunammite son. And then even when we look in, in the book of Revelation at the picture of Jesus, we, we see Elisha and Jesus both. They come to knock on a door. Okay, so that's the tie-in, part of the tie-in that we're going to see. So let's continue. Well, before that, let me say one other thing. But... But you look at what's maybe about to happen, and there are times in our lives, in your life, my life, when we're left with nothing, like no way out, and no plan, no doorway. And that's when we say, what am I supposed to do now? Yeah. Have you ever said that? What am I supposed to do now? Yeah. Look what happened, or look what I did, or look what, sometimes it's not only what we did, Sometimes it's other events that happen to us. But whether it's a choice you made or a choice that was made for you, we get in these situations where, what am I supposed to do now? And on a larger scale, when everything happened in the Garden of Eden and humanity fell, that was humanity's cry. What are we supposed to do now? Yeah. Like, we got kicked out of this beautiful garden. And now we have consequences. But the, then back on that micro level, what am I supposed to do now? We have these questions that can come to us in life. But this is actually where 
Jesus enters our lives. He enters right at the what am I supposed to do now juncture. That's where he shows up. He is amazing at showing up right when we need him and have that question. Okay, so we're going to keep reading in the same spot, just starting in verse 20. So the servant took him home, and his mother held him on her lap. But around noontime, he died. Okay, so this is a real turn in the story, right? She carried him up and laid him on the bed of the man of God, then shut the door and left him there. She sent a message to her husband, send one of the servants and a donkey so that I can hurry to the man of God and come right back. Why go today, he asked. It's neither a new moon festival nor a Sabbath. But she said, it will be all right. So she saddled the donkey and said to the servant, hurry, don't slow down unless I tell you to. She doesn't even tell her husband that their child has died. There is an urgency and a faith focus. She is focused, saying, if I can get to this man of God to help me. So he saddled the donkey and said to the servant, oh wait, I already said that. Yeah, don't slow down unless I tell you. Verse 25, as she approached the men of God at Mount Carmel, Elisha saw her in the distance. He said to Gehazi, look, the woman from Shunem is coming. Run out to meet her and ask her, is everything all right with you, your husband and your child? Yes, the woman told Gehazi, everything is fine. But when she came to the man of God, at the mountain, she fell to the ground before him and caught hold of his feet. Gehazi, you know, the servant, he began to push her away. But the man of God said, leave her alone. She's deeply troubled, but the Lord has not told me what it is. Then she said, did I ask you for a son, my Lord? And didn't I say, don't deceive me and get my hopes up? Then Elisha said to Gehazi, get ready to travel. Take my staff and go. Don't talk to anyone along the way. Go quickly and lay the staff on the child's face. She didn't say my son died. He just knows by her urgency and desperation that something that bad has happened. Right. And he's a prophet. But the boy's mother said, as surely as the Lord's live, li- as surely as the Lord lives and you yourself live, I won't go home unless you go with me. So Elisha returned with her. Gehazi hurried on ahead and laid the staff on the child's face, but nothing happened. There was no sign of life. He returned to meet Elisha and told him, the child is still dead. So here we are. The boy is indeed dead. And maybe one of us here may ask or someone online may say, this is Christmas Eve, Danielle. (laughs) Did you know it's Christmas Eve? Why Elisha and 2 Kings? Aren't we supposed to be at the manger in Bethlehem? Yes, and we will be. But we really need to understand that Jesus, he is both the newborn king, the crucified and risen Savior, and the one and only Messiah from the beginning of the good book to now. And that's where we see him showing up is in 2 Kings. So Jesus entered this boy's dead situation through his servant Elisha. Jesus, the door of salvation, came through his servant, Elisha, to knock on this dead boy's door. He knocks on the deadness in us. And to save him, to save this boy just like he saved you and me, that's what he came to do. Jesus, the door of salvation. I want us to keep reading. Verse 32, when Elisha arrived, the child was indeed dead, lying there on the prophet's bed. He went in alone and shut the door behind him and prayed to the Lord. Then he lay down on the child's body, placing his mouth on the child's mouth, his eyes on the child's eyes, and his hands on the child's hands. And he stretched out on him, the child's body, and as he stretched out on him, sorry, the child's body began to grow warm again. Elisha got up, walked back and forth across the room once, and then stretched himself out again on the child. This time the boy sneezed seven times and opened his eyes. Then Elisha summoned Gehazi. Call the child's mother, he said. And when she came in, Elisha said, here, take your son. She fell at his feet and bowed before him. 
overwhelmed with gratitude, then she took her son in her arms and carried him downstairs. Wow. That is the definition of salvation. Preservation or deliverance from harm, ruin, or loss. I want you to picture the prophet laying on the child, eye to eye, mouth to mouth, hand to hand. So he's literally laying his hands on top of the boy's hands, right? Like this. Eye to eye, mouth to mouth. That's an odd picture. But it's a picture of resurrection from the dead. It's a picture of a person following what the word of God says to him, not the word of God as in the Bible, as in the rhema direction of the Holy Spirit to lay on his dead, lifeless body and to come alive. God did not give this Shunem woman a son, a gift to take him back. She, he gave her this son to bless her, to further save her, to show her his power. And Jesus, at the very least, is that to us. At the least. At the most, we don't have words for what Jesus is. But at the least, God did not give us his son just to take him back. He gave him to leave him in our hearts. To be a gift that would never die, but always be alive. Did the boy die? Yes. Did Jesus die? Yes. Did the boy raise? Did Jesus raise? Like a thread of beauty all throughout the Bible, cover to cover, is Jesus. He's this beautiful, powerful Messiah thread that runs through every story. He's at once Elisha knocking on the door to bring salvation, and then again the boy coming back to life. And this woman represents us, the bride, the body, the children of God, who are saying, wow, we get to receive Jesus, and he'll never leave. But here, here is this story. I want to go back to him laying over this boy. What about us, our need for salvation? I want you to picture it. Hand over hand, mouth to mouth, eye to eye, Jesus came to our door of sin, shame, hopelessness, helplessness, and he laid himself upon our dead situation. Hand over hand, mouth to mouth, eye to eye, until life came back into us. It's not only about what we feel or what the situation says and what our eyes see. Do you hear what I'm doing? It's not only about what we touch with our hands, see with our eyes, or say with our mouth. His very presence and existence touches those things what we touch with our hands, what we say or what people have said with their mouths, what our eyes see. He transforms it all through his cross, through the door of his body and blood, through himself, the door of salvation. So our question is, will we trust him today to do that for us again and again, either for the first time or repeatedly? Will we trust him to do that? Or even for a dead situation, will we open the door and let him lay his life on our need, lay his body on our need? Jesus said that he is the resurrection and the life. So when we lay our petitions before him, even if we're already in Christ, and we lay our petitions before him, what looks dead can raise again because Jesus' life has laid upon it. So whatever feels dead to you, whatever feels lost to you, don't give up. Let the life of Jesus lay on your situation. He can heal us mentally. He can heal us physically. He heals us spiritually. That's why he came. So he is the only one who can do that for us. There was no other person in that area that could do what Elisha had done for this woman from Shunem. Jesus entered and used this uh, prophet to do his work. So the question again for us today, this Christmas Eve, is who is coming to your door? Elisha came to the door, but who is coming to your door? Who is coming to my door? And I don't know if it's up yet, and I'll give Stewie time because he is doing a lot <laughs> over there. 
But I want us to look at this painting. This is the painting we've been referencing all of Advent by William Hunt, The Light of the World. He painted it in 1854, at least he finished it in 1854. And he said that he felt like he had to paint it. He felt like a grip of the anointing of God. He didn't say anointing of God, he said, but he felt gripped divinely to do it. So we know that that's the anointing. And he painted this picture to represent Revelation 3.20, which says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in. And we'll read that again in a minute. But this is why he did this. So the question is, who's coming to our door? It's Jesus. He's always coming to the door to knock. And he's not just coming there to knock. He's coming to deliver us, save us, to deliver and save our loved ones, those we speak prayers over. And so Jesus, he becomes a door of revelation. He, even in Revelation 4, it says, Then as I looked, I saw a door standing open in heaven, and the same voice I heard before spoke to me like a trumpet blast. The voice said, Come up here, and I will show you what must happen after this. So Jesus even as he comes to our door and knocks, he also becomes a door of revelation. And so we see in this painting that the door, we've mentioned this a few times this month, the door is overgrown. It's overgrown with foliage. It's been unkept. It's not seen a visitor in a while. And that represents the heart of humanity. When we're closed off, when we have not had um, the right ability to even take care of ourselves. But then Jesus comes to that situation and he knocks. And the lighting is so specific. You see the, the beauty behind Jesus as he's coming at twilight. And the, the lantern that he carries, which means it's just as it's titled, he is the light of the world. And the doorknob is not there because the person inside has to open the door. He will not open it. So there's no doorknob, and that's on purpose. Because we have to be the one to open the door of our hearts and let Jesus in. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and dine with him. And he with me. And so there's just this invitation. It's voluntary. But he is our door of salvation today. And he is coming to our door to knock and wait for us to open it. He made the way and is the way to the salvation. His promise is that if we open the door of our hearts to him, he will come in and eat with us and have intimate, close fellowship with us as our Savior, as our Lord. In John 10, 9, he says, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. And so today we celebrate him, Jesus, as Messiah in the manger and as the Messiah of the empty tomb. The tomb of Jesus was a door that should have ended a story. But Jesus transformed it into a victorious exit that opened onto eternity for himself and all of us who put our faith in him. The door of salvation for all of humanity. Uh, you know, it, he transforms whatever is brought to him. And here in a moment, I'm going to have John Oakley read the Christmas story from Luke. It's Luke 2, 1 through 20. And, and at that point, when, I w when I'm going to have him come up in a minute, but at that point, we're going to invite the little ones in here to hear that and to sing silent night with us you know and we're gonna have some candlelight we'll turn the lights off and have our you know traditional silent night by candlelight but before I do that I really want to pray over us and and allow there to be room for us to invite Jesus in this Christmas Eve and so let's pray together again father we thank you for the gift of your son Jesus where he was first encountered in the manger and then later encountered by multiple people in need, the blind, who saw the lame who walked, the deaf who heard again, the mute who began to speak, 
Those tormented by demons were set free. Those dead were raised. Jesus. And then we encountered him on the cross. Marred beyond recognition, but the perfect lamb being sacrificed. The, ble- the, the lamb without blemish in the manger, all the way to the lamb without blemish on the cross. And every drop of your blood saved, healed, and delivered, Jesus. And we thank you for that. And so we take a moment now to acknowledge you, look to you, Jesus. And if we could just picture that he's literally walking up to the door of our heart, just like that painting, the light of the world. We invite you in, Jesus. We open the door to you. May you come in this Christmas Eve, this day, this evening, later. Have intimate, close fellowship with us. Dine with us. Teach us to be more like you to one another. To honor you. To keep your ways. To love you and obey you. And I want to pray, God, that you would do something specific in every heart that's hearing this message today or will ever hear it, that you will do something brand new in us. We honor and recognize you once again. Precious Lord, we worship you and bow before you. Thank you, Jesus, for setting us free and being our eternal gift and giving us the eternal gift of salvation. I pray you would bless your people with wisdom, knowledge, and revelation, an experiential relationship with you, Jesus. We pray right now in your holy name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. So just take the time today and this evening to maybe have another moment where you sit with the Lord and let him touch your heart. And for the believer, Christmas is every day. Resurrection is at Resurrection Sunday is every day. We live in the hope of the manger. We live in the victory of the resurrection as the followers of Jesus. And we're united with our brothers and sisters all over the world who are followers of Christ Jesus in truth. So now we're going to have this treat of hearing the Christmas story read. Um, John Oakley has become our de facto Christmas story reader. Um, And he always did that for our family before we opened gifts. But I marked it for you. John, it's Luke 2, 1 through 20. As you know, he's read it so many times. But he'll begin to read that. And I'll go get the little ones. And we will have a beautiful ending to our service here. Yeah, like uh, Daniel said, uh, I was always happy that our family uh, tradition was before we opened the gifts, we would acknowledge that the greatest gift was Jesus Christ. And we would read the story of Christmas and what what the Lord meant to us. And uh, it became a family tradition. I'm glad it did. And uh, Luke, uh, the second chapter... The Gospel of Luke, beginning at verse 1, it says, At that time, the Roman Emperor Augustus decreed that a census should be taken throughout the Roman Empire. And this was the first census taken when Quirinius was governor of Syria. All returned to their hometown, their their own ancestral towns, to register for this census. And because Joseph <clears throat> and because Joseph was a descendant of King David, he had to go to Bethlehem in Judea, David's ancient home. He, Joseph, traveled there from the village of Nazareth in Galilee where they lived. He took with him Mary, to whom he was engaged, who was now expecting a child. And while they were there, the time came for her baby to be born. And she gave birth to her firstborn son. 
She wrapped him snugly in strips of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no lodging available for them. That night, there were shepherds staying in the fields nearby, guarding their flocks of sheep. And suddenly, an angel of the Lord appeared unto them, and the radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded them. They were terrified, but the angel reassured them. Don't be afraid, he said. I bring you good news that, he will, that will bring great joy to all people. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David. And you will recognize him by this sign. You will find a baby wrapped snugly in strips of cloth lying in a manger. Suddenly, the angel was joined by a vast host of others, the armies, plural, of heaven, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and peace on earth to those with whom God is pleased. When the angels had returned to heaven, the shepherds said to each other, Let's go to Bethlehem. Let's see this thing that has happened which the Lord has told us about. They hurried to the village and found Mary and Joseph, and there was the baby lying in the manger. After seeing him, the shepherds told everyone what had happened and what the angel had said to them about this child. All who heard the shepherds' story were astonished, but Mary kept all these things in her heart and thought about them often. The shepherds went back to their flocks, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen. It was just as the angel had told them. Well, amen to that. That was beautiful, wasn't it? We just love everyone. want to say Merry Christmas and Happy New Year to everyone. We'll be here next Sunday. Um, which is New Year's Eve, but we'll be there in the morning. <laughs> so if you want to come to church next Sunday, we'll be here. We would love to have you. Um.